Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Mark Andrew Holacek, and I come to you from my hermitage in Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, and uh, welcome to the second episode of The Real Thomas Jefferson. Today, I want to talk about what did Thomas Jefferson really think about slavery? And uh, I think that is a very interesting issue, and I'd like to share my thoughts uh, with what I think Jefferson thought about slavery. Now, most of us tend to think of slavery as we do life. You either have life or you don't have life. If, uh, with the surcease of life, you have death. But um, Jefferson thought of, and I think rightfully so, and like most people of his day thought of slavery and freedom as something like health. It's not that one possesses or can possess absolute health, perfect health, but there are always degrees of health or degrees of sickness, as it were, if you want to look at the, the polar concept. So, you know, we tend to think of slavery, one either is a slave or one is not. Uh, when slavery, Jefferson, I think, thought of slavery as uh, not of an all or nothing concept, but something that admits some degrees. And I want to get clear on that. So that takes us to an 1814 letter on September 10th to his dear friend, Dr. Thomas Cooper, whom he wanted to have at his University of Virginia uh, as a professor. And um, he talks about the lots, Jefferson talks about the lot of slaves in the Southern states. He says, these are better fed in these states, warmer clothed and labor less than the journey journeymen or day laborers of England. They have comfort, too, of numerous families in the midst of whom they live without want or the fear of it, a solace which few of the laborers of England possess. So he's talking about comparing the lot of southern slaves um, to uh, the lot of many uh, journeymen in England, right, uh, separated from their families and subject to, to, to brutal work just to earn, try to earn a subsistence living. So he talks also of the practice, the British practice of impressment. And he says, um, hundreds of thousands of British soldiers and seamen subject to the same without seeing it at the end of their career. And when age and accident shall have rendered them unequal to labor, the certainty which the other has that he will never want. So he's talking about the practice of British impressment. Britain had the largest Navy in the world at the time. Uh, so there was ever, uh, a need to have seamen, and um, Britain would be in the practice of sometimes stopping boats in transit and boarding the boats and search for presumed de deserters from the British Navy, and that happened quite a bit. Uh, a lot of men were forced to into service. They didn't want to, so they deserted, but oftentimes uh, sort of unscrupulous British captains would search other boats, say an American boat, and take a few American sailors, uh, claiming that to take to his boat a few American sailors and claim that they were actually British deserters and so forth. So there was this practice of impressment uh, that people against their will are forced onto a ship to be a seaman and removed from family and friends, oftentimes many thousands of miles, okay? Now, you know, he talks about the notion of bodily coercion that slaves right uh, experience, he said. Um, it's comparable to the plight of a British seaman who is reduced to this bondage by force in flagrant, in flagrant violation of his own consent and of his natural right in his own person. So going back to the natural rights that are promised in his declaration, uh, based on human equality, all are presumed um, in desert of the rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, right? So he says, uh, when he talks about the British laborers, he contrasts the, the impressed seamen. He says, does not the moral coercion of want subject their will as despotically to that their, of their employer as the physical constraint does the soldier, the seaman, or the slave? So talking about slavery, there is a, <clears throat> there is the sort of, um, imposition of one person's will on another, and that happens in times of war. Um, the military uh, uh, commander tells the uh, subjects, uh, tells his uh, uh, privates and so forth, his, his men of his army what they have to do, and they don't have a will of their own. They're supposed to obey. That happens in 
uh, with respect to the soldier. It happens to the seaman who's pressed and it happens as well to the slave. So what Jefferson's getting at here is that there are degrees of slavery, and I'll, I'll say more um, what that is. I mean, at this point, you might be wondering what is Jefferson trying to do, and you're probably right to be thinking that, but he's just trying to throw out a, a lot of different ways of thinking about um, one's will not being one's own, and that's what I think he's getting at when it comes to slavery here, okay? Um, now Jefferson next goes to a caveat. He says, do not mistake me. I am not advocating slavery. I'm not justifying the wrongs we have committed on a foreign people by the example of another nation committing equal wrongs on their own subjects. So he's talking about the wrongs that the British people uh, daily do on their own people, uh, which are comparable and, and in some sense worse than what uh, uh, the imposition imposed on slaves, right? Jefferson tells Cooper, he says, you know, there's no sacrifice I wouldn't make to implement a practic practicable plan of abolition, of, of, excuse me, of, of abolishing every vestige of this moral and political depravity. So he's here making a commitment um, to saying, you know, if I could get rid of slavery at this point, I would. I would put all my energies to, to doing so. Um, he again a caveat he says i'm not at present comparing the condition and degree of suffering to which oppression has reduced the man of one color with the condition and degree of suffering to which oppression has reduced a man of another color equally condemning both so he's talking about he brings in the issue of of whites here obviously uh, enslaving black people um and so he's uh, you know saying um talking about this degree of, of, of oppression, notice how he uses the word condition and degree of suffering, because there are degrees of suffering uh, that people undergo. Now, here I turn to two significant issues. Jefferson willingly uh, is in advocacy of doing whatever he can within his power to do anything, whatever the sacrifice to himself is to rid of uh, of the atrocity of the institution of slavery. Now, so one can ask, right, if he's willing to do anything uh, in, in, uh, as an advocate for abolishing slavery, why doesn't he do it? Um, the answer is relatively simple. I mean, the plan must be practicable. Everybody talked about there were abolitionists, you know, prior to the Civil War in the North, you know, uh, saying we need to uh, rid of the institution of slavery. The problem is they didn't have a plan. Um, everybody knew that any sort of plan that asked for the immediate abolition of slavery uh, and removal of slaves from the conditions of, on plantations, for example, would cripple the economy of the South. And, and because the South had such a robust economy with the cotton and tobacco and other products that they grew there, the effects of a crippled Southern economy would have uh, uh, the effect of crippling the nation as a whole. Uh, so Jefferson says, you know, the plan must be practicable. Do you want to come up here, Jeff? Come on. All right. He's on my lap. He says, I have seen no proposition so expedient on the whole as that of emancipation as those born after a given day. So he's imagine, you know, let's set a day and say after, as of this date, they'll all people shall be free, there'll be no more slavery, um, and of their education and expatriation at a proper age. So the three E's, emancipation, education, and expatriation, you know, uh, leaving the, um, leaving the, um, go down, leaving the nation. And why does he say that slaves need to leave the nation? Um, one is, he says in, um, Query 14 of his notes on the state of Virginia it says, you know, black people will not forget the wrongs that have been done to them. So there's always the possibility of, of revolution and, and all sorts of violence between black people and white people. So um, talked about, you know, if we have emancipation, education, which is costly, you know, Jefferson just doesn't think you can free people. They have to be educated and expatriation. This would give time for a gradual extinction of that species of labor in substitute of another and lesser severity of the shock, okay? Um, now he adds, the idea of emancipating the whole at once, the old as well as the young, 
and retaining them here is of those only who have not the guide of either knowledge or experience on the subject. For men probably of any color, but of this color we know, brought up from their infancy without necessity for thought or forecast, for, for thinking for the future, are by their habits rendered as incapable as children of taking care of themselves and are extinguished promptly wherever industry is necessary for raising the young. So the idea is, is that you just can't free black people. They need to be educated as well. So it's a matter, and Je Jefferson is so claimed he freed so few of his slaves because his concern was that they, you know, they had to have a proper education or they had to have a proper um, craft, uh, carpentry or some such thing. Um, uh, so that when they removed, say, to white society or, or it, to someplace in the North where slavery wasn't um, law, they would, you know, they would be able to find work. And uh, a second desideratum for Jefferson is to be a lightly colored in skin. And, and that was simply because the conditions for black people in free states was not necessarily so good as people always presume that to have your freedom is just so important. So um, we look, a second problem is the slavery versus freedom issue. We, we look at this as it's black and white. And Jefferson didn't think that way. He thought it's black and white when we deal with the issue on the political level, right? As he talks in the declaration, all people, and he talks of African-Americans, well, having uh, are by nature free and have the right to liberty. So it was part of his declaration that black people, all people, are, are deserving of freedom. But he thinks that liberty and slavery, I could say, or, or its lack, liberty's lack, exists in degrees and under, and only under certain conditions, right? Let's go back to the people who are pressed in the service, uh, impressed, pressed in the service in the British Navy, right? They're thousands of miles away from family and friend, and they have no say in the matter. They're just thrown up on boats. So, are these people better off or worse off than slaves on southern plantations? Uh, Jefferson says earlier he thinks that they're not. What about uh, British laborers that are working long days in, in uh, sweatshops, what we call today sweatshops, uh, working very, very long days in, in cold conditions in the winter and hot conditions in the summer just to have a subsistence living? right, as you saw with Marley on Scrooge, right? So there is, Jefferson is talking about liberty in the absolute as a political necessity that we all need, are deserving because of our equality, we're deserving of liberty in the categorical sense in, in the fact that the government, we freedom from government intrusion telling us how we ought to live our lives, right? That's the big liberty that Jefferson is talking about in some sense when he talks about it absolutely. But as it should be obvious to anybody who thinks clearly on the issue, having political liberty in that sense is really not much help if we don't have uh, life enhancing and viable options for a living. Um, I use the example of, of going into a a grocery store to buy bread, but if they have only one type of bread, you're really not free to choose, you know, all different, you're not free to choose among a lot of different alternatives. Imagine a country in which there's only one job, namely that of the husbandman. You can choose to be a farmer. If you don't like to be a farmer, don't want to be a farmer, you can choose to be a farmer. Well, that's not any sort of freedom that's worth having. And Jefferson wanted most people to be farmers, and he thought they'd be happier that way. Um, because he thought it was a, a, a life-enhancing occupation. You're feeding other people, um, providing necessities for life, and you're free. You're working the land. Um, but, you know, you need options, right? So Jefferson, in his draft, dec uh, his draft uh, constitution for the state of Virginia, thought that all free males uh, that did not have at least 50 acres of property, and property was what made you a person at the time should be given 50 acres of land because there was land to a plenty in Virginia. So, uh, but what you did with that land, once you got it is up to you, right? You're free not to use it, not to put it to use and to, to let it run into degeneration. So 
what I'm saying here is Jefferson did not think of slavery or freedom of liberty in the sense that you know someone either has it or fails to have it. There are degrees of slavery, just as there are degrees of liberty. People are pressed into slave-like conditions all over the globe uh, against their will, even though that's not called slavery. It's called impressment. It's called serving in the British Navy and, and, and whatnot. Uh, so there's no such thing as perfect freedom. There's no such thing as perfect slavery. And uh, I, I refer you also to the Roman Stoic Seneca, who was of the disposition to say, as the Stoics always said, is that freedom was a disposition of soul, of, of mind. Uh, Seneca would say that one is perfectly free in any condition whatsoever, right? Where he's in a condition where he has many options, free to do whatever he wants, or in a condition where one's sitting in a jail cell and, and, and is not allowed to do anything but just sit and rot in a jail cell. Seneca thought that as long as one's mind is one own, um, one's own, one is free. So Jefferson, as it were, um, when we talk about who, what did Jefferson really think about slavery? He did not think it was a, 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 an all or nothing condition. It was not a condition as it is on paper that you either have, you, you don't have any freedom. Slavery was a condition when uh, legal slavery in the South was a condition when legally you're, you're not uh, your own person, right? But Jefferson thought following Seneca, any person can be free if his mind is in such and such a state, then any person can be a slave if his mind is such and such a state. So that's the notion of we get from Jefferson's letter to uh, his uh, 1814, his 18, yeah, 1814 letter to Thomas Cooper, Jefferson on slavery. I hope you'll like this uh, episode and we'll do another next week. Thank you for tuning in. TTFN. Bye-bye.